John Owen provides a detailed account of the scholarly work devoted to one of the most influential books of the New Testament, the Epistle to the Romans. Despite its foundational role in Christian theology, Owen notes that there are no known standalone commentaries on Romans from the early Church Fathers. However, theologians such as Origen, Jerome, Chrysostom, Augustine, Theodoret, Oecumenius, and Theophylact have incorporated explanations of this epistle within broader exegesis of scriptural texts. The impetus for creating separate detailed expositions of Romans grew substantially after the Reformation, a period marked by the desire to return to the sources of Christian doctrine and scripture. Among the early contributions was Luther's learned introductory work, which was followed by scholia from Reformation leaders such as Zwingli and Melanchthon. The Swiss reformer Bullinger is credited with producing the first complete commentary on Romans. Bucer, notable for his tenure as a theology professor at the University of Cambridge under King Edward VI, contributed another significant commentary. Not long after, John Calvin composed a highly regarded exposition on the epistle in Strasbourg in 1539, which remains a touchstone within Reformed theological literature. Peter Martyr's analysis came forth, becoming sufficiently influential to warrant an English translation by 1568. Beyond these, Rodolf Galter, a prominent minister in Zurich, also produced noteworthy insights into Romans. The early 17th century introduced the scholarship of Piraeus, a theology professor at the University of Heidelberg. He delivered extensive lectures on the epistle, particularly focusing on defending Protestantism against Roman Catholic critiques, including the sophisticated arguments of Bellarmine, a leading Jesuit thinker. Piraeus's work is described as being exceptionally comprehensive, addressing diverse topics related to Romans, clarifying contentious religious disputes, and correcting the misinterpretations by Socinians. Though Piraeus received acclaim for his erudition, his scholastic writing style may be less approachable for modern readers. Owen's survey emphasizes the enduring influence of the epistle to the Romans and the diverse efforts to interpret its teachings across various Christian traditions. From the early church to post-Reformation scholarship, Romans has been a vital text for doctrinal understanding and debate. Also, Owen provides a discerning overview of significant commentaries on Paul's epistle to the Romans, offering insights into the evolution of theological thought and the varying adherence to Calvinist doctrine across different periods and regions. He begins with Francois Turretin, a theology professor at the University of Geneva in the early 1700s. Turretin's work, although generally orthodox, exhibited a subtle departure from the rigor of Calvin's teachings, exemplifying a trend at the time which slightly diluted the purity of Reformed doctrine. The implications of Turretin's leanings were such that they could erode the fundamental tenets of Christianity if taken further along their trajectory. Owen then shifts his focus to the first noteworthy English commentary on the Book of Romans, a work from the 17th century written by Elnathan Parr, who held the position of rector in Suffolk. Parr's connection with Sir Nathaniel Bacon, whom he cites as having listened to the content in sermon form before publication, suggests a depth of intellectual exchange among the contemporaries of that era. While Parr's language now seems antiquated, its essence contains powerful insights and is staunchly reflective of Protestant reformer ideologies. For nearly two centuries following Parr's contribution, no significant solo works on Romans emerged. Nonetheless, the 19th century marked a renaissance in biblical scholarship on Romans. Continental scholars such as Flatt and Tholuck from Germany enriched the commentary landscape, while British and American theologians brought forth their interpretations. Notably in the UK, J. Fry, Robert Haldane, and Dr. Chalmers produced commentaries, holding true to the Calvinist framework. Owen gives particular attention to the American contributions from scholars like Moses Stewart of Andover, Albert Barnes, and Charles Hodge of Princeton. Stewart stands out for his erudition and critical analysis, while Barnes excels in detailed exegesis. Hodge, on the other hand, is recognized for his sharp and succinct commentary, with a commitment to orthodox Calvinist interpretations. Although Stewart and Barnes sometimes veer from the stringent orthodoxy reminiscent of the deviations of Turretin, 
Hodge maintains a consistent alignment with core Calvinist beliefs. These scholars' works collectively fortify the ongoing theological discourse on one of the most influential letters in the New Testament, each offering a distinct lens through which the epistle to the Romans can be viewed and understood. Moreover, Owen's reflection on the exegesis of the epistle to the Romans explores the varying methods and theological perspectives of different commentators, each bringing their own unique strengths to the understanding of this foundational Christian text. Owen begins by noting a commendable level of agreement among commentators from his homeland, Britain, despite their varied church affiliations. He speaks highly of the lectures by the Reverend J. Fry, which, although stemming from a staunch predestinarian viewpoint, are rich with experiential and practical notes that resonate with believers from different walks of life. In contrast, the lay commentator R. Haldane, ESQ, is recognized for his uncompromising orthodoxy and his exceptional talents in exposition, holding firmly to the doctrines he believes to be true. Of particular note is Dr. Chalmers, whose lectures spread across four volumes. Chalmers, a philosopher of the first rank who also humbly experienced his Christian faith, navigates the breadth of divine truth with both the sharp insight of an eagle and the simplicity of a child. Owen remarks on Chalmers' unique stature, his exemplary intellectual soundness, his tempered imagination, and his unparalleled ability to elucidate and expand upon complex ideas. Owen then moves on to commend John Calvin's work on Romans for its clarity and brevity. Calvin, renowned for his Reformation-era insights, eschews word-by-word -word analysis in favor of capturing the essence of spiritual principles. Owen sees Calvin's style as direct and logical, capable of shedding light on intricate scriptural passages through succinct reasoning, and occasionally through beautifully articulated thoughts reflective of a truly imaginative mind. Calvin's commentary also carries a sense of dignified grandeur, which Owen finds in very few other writers. According to Professor Stewart, whom Owen quotes, Calvin's commentary excels in carefully exploring the logic and progression of thought within the epistle, while largely foregoing detailed linguistic critique. Stewart praises Calvin for his ability to untangle perplexing theological concerns with seeming ease and without a reliance on intellectual showmanship. Furthermore, Owen discusses the recent edition's additional annotations put in place to compensate for the earlier version's lack of verbal criticism. These annotations aim to bring the reader up to date with interpretations from more recent critics and commentators. They include citations from various authors, present different translations deemed commendable, and make occasional references to comparable passages all to ensure that even readers without knowledge of the original Greek language can comprehend the full implications of the text. Through this added layer of scholarly analysis, Owen seeks to enhance the reader's understanding and engagement with the epistle to the Romans. In addition, Owen provides a nuanced perspective on the interpretation of the scriptures, particularly focusing on the epistle of Paul in the New Testament. He acknowledges that scholars and critics have brought forth a spectrum of meanings for various words and passages within the Bible. While some have voiced concerns that such diversity could undermine the certainty of scriptural truth, Owen contends that these variations rarely affect the essentials of Christian doctrine, experience, or ethical practice. Instead, he accentuates that the multiplicity of interpretations often enhances understanding, making the scripture's message clearer and more impactful. Despite this belief in interpretative diversity, Owen warns against an excessive eagerness for novelty and biblical criticism. He criticizes a certain intellectual trend, particularly prevalent among certain German theologians of the previous century, which he views as an unhealthy pursuit of criticism for its own sake, divorced from a genuine quest for truth. These critics, according to Owen, indulge in curiosity and novelty-seeking that lead to interpretations which undermine foundational Christian tenets. He contrasts these gladiators of criticism with truth-seeking exegetes who use their spiritual experience and consistent scriptural analysis to elucidate the texts, an experience Owen deems even more valuable than critical sharpness. Further, Owen addresses the efforts to draw parallels between the stylistic elements of the New Testament writings and classical literature. 
Notable scholars, such as Blackwall and several German academics, endeavored to demonstrate the classical resonances in the style of the apostolic writings to increase their appeal to the literary elite. Owen, however, views this as a needless and ultimately futile undertaking. He debates that the New Testament writers were deeply ingrained in the Jewish faith, and their expressions were naturally influenced by the Hebraistic style of the Old Testament. Consequently, the interpretation of terms used in the New Testament should be based on the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and occasionally on the original Hebrew language itself. Through this assertion, Owen affirms the unique and indigenous quality of the Scripture, rooted in Jewish tradition, and illuminated by an understanding steeped in spiritual authenticity. Besides, Owen asserts the profound principle that the proclamation of the gospel should rely on divine truth and power rather than human wisdom or eloquence. He critically examines Apostle Paul's deliberate avoidance of excellency of speech, a tactic aimed at ensuring that the core message of Christ's sacrifice is not overshadowed by the oratorical skills or intellectual prowess of the messenger. For Owen, this approach is not merely a preference but a fundamental principle that aligns with the essence of the gospel itself. Owen admires the intentional decision by God to refrain from bestowing superhuman eloquence upon the apostles. This divine choice is not arbitrary but purposeful, aiming to anchor faith in the power and wisdom of God rather than in the persuasive abilities of humans. The gospel's power, according to Owen, emanates from its divine origin and its capacity to transform lives, a trait that should not be diluted by over-reliance on human artistry and its delivery. In providing historical context, Owen situates the epistle to the Romans chronologically among Paul's writings. He notes its composition in Corinth around 57 or 58 AD, following Paul's conversion in AD 35. Owen delineates Paul's ministry, highlighting the compact period, approximately 13 years, during which Paul penned his epistles. This period marks a prolific phase in Paul's life, wherein he profoundly shaped the theological foundations of the early church through his writings. Owen's commentary extends beyond mere biblical interpretation. It delves into the essence of Christian preaching and the pivotal role of divine providence in the dissemination of the gospel. By indicating Paul's conscious rejection of human eloquence in favor of divine truth, Owen maintains a timeless principle. The power of the gospel is rooted not in the allure of its presentation, but in the transformative power of its message, underpinned by the wisdom and authority of God. Additionally, Owen provides a nuanced historical account of the Apostle Paul's journey and the nascent Christian community in Rome. He specifies that Paul arrived in Rome around 61 AD and was detained there for about two years. Post-release, it's believed that Paul revisited Judea and embarked on a missionary tour through Asia Minor and Macedonia, wintering in Nicopolis in 64 AD. His journey took him back to Rome by 65 AD, where he faced imprisonment and martyrdom in the subsequent year. Contrary to some traditions, Owen casts doubt on Paul's purported visit to Spain, disputing for a more restrained understanding of his missionary travels. He then shifts focus to the introduction of Christianity in Rome, which he describes as shrouded in ambiguity. Owen hypothesizes that Romans who converted at Pentecost might have been instrumental in propagating Christianity upon their return. He points out the significance of early Roman Christians like Andronicus, Junia, and Rufus, whose early conversion and dedicated ministry laid the groundwork for the Christian community in Rome. These figures, possibly bolstered by Paul's converts, were pivotal in the faith's proliferation. Addressing the broader narrative of the Roman Church's founding, Owen scrutinizes the tradition surrounding the roles of Apostles Peter and Paul. While early Church Fathers like Irenaeus and Tertullian advanced the tradition of Peter and Paul jointly founding the Roman Church, Owen critically assesses these claims. He particularly contests the tradition of Peter's 25-year episcopate in Rome as incongruous with scriptural accounts, noting that even some discerning Catholic scholars dismiss these traditional narratives. Owen's analysis, therefore, advocates for a historically consistent interpretation of the early Christian history in Rome, reiterating the need for a careful examination of traditional accounts against scriptural and historical evidence. 
Also, Owen's examination of Apostle Peter's presence in Rome critically assesses traditional claims within the context of early Christian history, particularly focusing on the overlap with Apostle Paul's activities. Owen argues convincingly against the notion that Peter was in Rome during several key periods, especially when Paul was actively ministering and writing to the early church. Owen begins by noting the absence of any mention of Peter in Paul's epistle to the Romans, penned around 57 or 58 AD. This omission, he contends, is significant, suggesting that Peter was neither in Rome at that time nor had he been there earlier. If Peter had been in Rome and actively involved in the church, Owen posits that Paul would undoubtedly have mentioned him. This argument extends to the period of Paul's imprisonment in Rome, 61, 63 AD, where again there is no mention of Peter in any of Paul's writings or epistles. Owen finds this silence telling, especially considering the significant role Peter played in the early church. The same pattern is observed during Paul's last imprisonment in Rome, 65, 66 AD, further strengthening Owen's argument. Moreover, Owen references Piraeus, who challenges the tradition of Peter's Roman ministry by examining his whereabouts as documented in the Acts of the Apostles and the Epistle to the Galatians. According to these texts, Peter was primarily in Judea, not Rome, during these critical periods. Piraeus's analysis supports the idea that Peter continued his ministry predominantly among the Jews. Furthermore, Owen dismisses the tradition of Peter's Roman ministry as part of an era prone to pious fraud and religious myth-making. He specifically criticizes the testimony of a third-century presbyter, Caius, who claimed to have seen the graves of Peter and Paul in Rome, attributing it to the period's tendency towards creating and believing religious fabrications. Concluding, Owen reflects on the early Christian church in Rome, noting that despite its lack of direct founding or influence by Peter during Paul's time, it was known for its strong faith. However, it also faced internal conflicts, particularly among Jewish believers, which Paul's epistles sought to address and alleviate. In addition, Owen's intricate dissection of the epistle to the Romans offers a profound exploration into its structure and overarching themes. At the outset, the epistle begins with an address, Romans 1, 1 where Paul expresses his yearning to visit the believers in Rome and delivers a succinct yet potent synopsis of the gospel's profound truths. Owen then dives into the core of the epistle, the doctrine of justification, unfolding over several chapters, Romans 1, 8. This section profoundly discusses the dire necessity of justification, repeating humanity's universal entanglement in sin and guilt, irrespective of being Jew or Gentile. It transitions into a profound exploration of the nature and essence of justification, vividly portrayed through the emblematic figures of Abraham and David. This section culminates in a detailed exposition of the multifaceted fruits of justification, encompassing peace, grace, a transformative death to sin, eternal life, liberation from the law's grasp, and the overpowering sway of sin, alongside an embracement of holiness, the Spirit's support endurance in suffering and steadfast perseverance. Owen's analysis proceeds to a reflective section on God's dealings vindicated, Romans 9, 11, tackling complex theological concepts such as election, reprobation, the interplay of unbelief and faith, and the nuanced narrative of the Jews' rejection, the Gentiles' inclusion, and the prophesied restoration of the Jews. The epistle then seamlessly transitions into a discourse on Christian duties, Romans 12, 15, 13, urging believers towards a life marked by devotion to God, judicious utilization of spiritual gifts, pervasive love, proactive benevolence, compliance with established authorities, and a compassionate forbearance towards the spiritually immature. This segment underlines the essence of Christian community life, advocating for support to the weak, pursuit of unity, and recognition of Christ's universal lordship over both Jews and Gentiles. Owen concludes his exposition with the epistle's conclusion, Romans 15, 13 onwards, 16, reflecting on Paul's apostolic labors, his heartfelt intentions to commune with the Roman believers and a series of salutations. It encapsulates warnings against disruptive influences within the church, assures believers of impending victory over such adversities, and culminates in a doxology offering exuberant praises to God.
This meticulous analysis by Owen not only dissects the epistle's structure, but also underscores its profound blend of doctrinal depth and practical application, manifesting the epistle's timeless relevance to the Christian faith. Further, Owen addresses the profound dichotomy of human righteousness, merit, versus divine righteousness, grace. He values this epistle alongside Galatians for its lucid exposition of these concepts, revered by enlightened Christians yet often distorted by those lacking spiritual insight. Owen emphasizes the unanimous consensus among spiritually minded individuals. Salvation is entirely by grace, not by works. Despite the clear language and reasoning of Romans, he notes the puzzling tendency of some to misinterpret its teachings, attributing this to the inherent nature of the unregenerated human, as scripture and human history reveal. The natural man, devoid of spiritual discernment, often misunderstands scripture. Specifically, Owen accentuates resistance to the concepts of grace and faith over merit and works, which confront human pride, a dominant trait in fallen humanity. He recalls historical instances, notably when the authority of tradition overshadowed scripture, leading to erroneous notions like the transferability of merit. Owen criticizes the idea of salvation being partly by faith and partly by works as a subtle yet profound error, akin to endorsing the principle of merit. He laments the complex evasions and intricate arguments crafted to reject scripture's clear testimony, attempting to blend grace with works a mixture explicitly refuted by Paul in Romans 11, 6. In sum, Owen portrays the epistle to the Romans as a battleground of divine truth against human resistance, where the gospel's clarity confronts human pride and misunderstanding. He asserts the epistle's significance in articulating the principle of salvation by grace, a cornerstone of Christian doctrine consistently upheld by spiritually enlightened believers against the persistent tide of human misinterpretation and pride. Besides, Owen digs into the human proclivity to seek salvation through external rituals rather than faith. Historically, this trend is evident across cultures, with individuals relying on sacrifices, rituals, and devout practices as means to merit divine acceptance. Owen highlights this pattern not only in pagans but also among the Israelites. Despite being endowed with religious ceremonies intended as conduits to genuine faith, they misinterpreted these rituals as inherently meritorious, even adding their own rights to augment their perceived worthiness before God. This misconception seeped into early Christianity, manifesting in an overabundance of ceremonies that eclipsed the core Christian tenet of salvation through faith. Owen perceives this overemphasis on formalities and religious acts as indicative of a fundamental misunderstanding or disregard of the principle that salvation is attained through faith, not deeds. Owen refers to Paul's epistle to the Romans as the antidote to this misguided notion. Paul meticulously establishes the universality of sin, indicating the innate guilt of both Jews and Gentiles before God. He then introduces the divine scheme of redemption, maintaining that salvation is granted solely through God's grace and human faith, excluding all forms of human works. Owen stresses that truly grasping and embracing this concept necessitates an acknowledgement of one's sinful state and the accompanying condemnation. Once this salvation is genuinely understood, all external practices and privileges are perceived in their proper light as mere instruments or aids on the spiritual journey. Consequently, our personal endeavors, regardless of their scale or sacrificial nature, are seen not as means to earn merit, but as inherently flawed and only acceptable to God through the intercession of Christ. In this edition, Owen notes the omission of title page samples from previous versions, stating that they are accessible in the existing translations held by the readers. Additionally, Calvin, in his correspondence with Simon Grinius, articulates a vision for biblical exegesis that champions clarity and succinctness. He debates that the essence of a scripture expounder's role is to unveil the original author's intent without veering off into tangential or overly elaborate explanations. While Calvin recognizes the spectrum of preferences regarding scriptural interpretation, he personally advocates for a style that is both concise and lucid. He disputes that an expounder should refrain from overwhelming the reader with excessive details or deviating from the core message of the scripture. 
Despite the divergence in opinions on the ideal approach to biblical exposition, Calvin calls for mutual respect among scholars, advocating for a harmonious coexistence of different interpretative styles. He himself is drawn to a more compressed and straightforward method of interpretation, valuing brevity as a means to maintain the focus on the scripture's original message. Calvin acknowledges the ambitious nature of his endeavor to contribute to the theological discourse, particularly through his commentary on Paul's epistle to the Romans. He is acutely aware of the formidable legacy left by a multitude of distinguished scholars who have previously examined the complexities of this epistle. Despite this, he does not shy away from expressing his perspective on the extensive work done by both ancient and contemporary commentators. He holds the contributions of the ancients in high regard, attributing great authority to their work due to their piety, learning, and sanctity. For contemporary scholars, he opts for a more general acknowledgement of their efforts rather than detailed critiques. Ultimately, Calvin's preface is a testament to his humility and his commitment to advancing the church's comprehension of Scripture. He points out the importance of presenting the biblical text in a clear and accessible manner while respecting the rich tapestry of interpretative approaches that have shaped theological understanding throughout the ages. Also, Calvin modestly situates himself amidst the theological luminaries of his era. He expresses admiration for Philip Melanchthon's profound scholarship and selective focus on critical theological themes, Bullinger's commendable blend of erudition and simplicity, and Bucer's exhaustive and intricate exegesis, distinguished by his vast knowledge and intellectual depth. Calvin clarifies that he does not aspire to overshadow these esteemed figures, but rather to contribute constructively to the theological discourse. He acknowledges their well-deserved reputation and authority within the Christian community, and reiterates that their significant contributions nonetheless leave room for further refinement, embellishment, or clarification of the scriptures by future scholars. Calvin's approach is characterized by its complementary nature. He notes Melanchthon's concentrated yet selective treatment of theological matters and Bucer's extensive, sometimes overly detailed examinations. Calvin identifies an opportunity to provide a balanced, concise interpretation of the scriptures, aiming to cater to both the busy individual and the layperson. His objective is to bring clarity where the divergent perspectives of his predecessors might cause confusion among ordinary readers. Calvin seeks to present a comprehensive yet succinct commentary that synthesizes and builds upon previous interpretations, being considerate of the reader's time and level of theological understanding. His endeavor is to bridge the gaps left by others without being repetitive, ensuring that his work is both insightful for those steeped in theological study and accessible to those less familiar with in-depth theological discourse. Calvin's intention is not just to compile a mere summary of previous works, but to offer a refined, accessible, and time-efficient guide to understanding the scriptures, enhancing the reader's comprehension and engagement with the biblical text. Moreover, Calvin explores the complexities and responsibilities of interpreting the scriptures. Calvin begins by acknowledging the potential utility of his work while maintaining a humble stance, recognizing the inherent risks involved in interpreting the divine word. He expresses a profound reverence for the scriptures, considering them the most sacred entity on earth and equating any mishandling or casual interpretation with sacrilege. Calvin is acutely aware of the historical disagreements among scholars regarding scriptural interpretation. He perceives these differences not as shortcomings but as a divine strategy aimed at fostering humility and encouraging fraternal bonds among believers. For Calvin, the interpretation of scripture should never be driven by personal whims or desires for novelty. Instead, it should be a process dictated by necessity, earnest benevolence, and a commitment to the principles of faith. This approach, according to Calvin, minimizes the risk of individual biases and interpretations, thus preserving unity in the core tenets of Christianity. Despite his significant contributions, Calvin refrains from passing judgment on his own work, preferring to leave this task to Grineus, whose judgment he holds in high regard. This deference repeats the communal and respectful nature of theological discourse, 
and underlines Calvin's desire for his interpretations to be scrutinized and validated by a trusted and scholarly peer. The letter, rich in humility and respect for both the divine word and scholarly discourse, encapsulates Calvin's approach to theology, one that is thoughtful, cautious, and deeply aware of the sacred responsibility that comes with interpreting the Word of God. Furthermore, Calvin approaches the text with profound reverence, acknowledging its intrinsic excellence and the futility of trying to amplify its significance through mere human commendation. He underscores that the epistle itself, with its compelling introduction, eloquently expresses its value far beyond any external praise. Calvin, therefore, chooses to focus on the content and structure of the epistle, recognizing it as a key to unlocking the most profound mysteries of Scripture. Calvin admires the epistle's methodical arrangement, noting its artful composition and systematic presentation. He meticulously traces the progression of Paul's argument. It begins with the affirmation of his apostleship, proceeds to endorse the gospel, and seamlessly transitions into discussing faith. This progression strategically leads to the epistle's central theme, justification by faith, a doctrine that Paul explores until the conclusion of the fifth chapter. The essence of these initial chapters, as Calvin summarizes, is the declaration that true righteousness is accessible only through God's mercy, manifested in Christ and embraced by faith, as presented in the gospel. He observes a prevailing human tendency to remain oblivious to the necessity of faith-based righteousness, attributed to self-deception, and a false sense of security in one's own righteousness. In addition, people's indulgence in worldly desires and deep-rooted complacency often deter them from seeking the righteousness that faith offers. Recognizing this spiritual lethargy, Paul embarks on a dual mission. He endeavors to expose human sinfulness and arouse the spiritually indifferent from their slumber. To achieve this, Paul employs the profound impact of divine judgment, intending to awaken and motivate individuals towards a sincere pursuit of righteousness through faith. Further, Calvin's exposition of Romans presents a thorough indictment of humanity's pervasive sinfulness. He begins with a condemnation of the ingratitude of mankind throughout history, noting that despite the evident work of an extraordinary creator in the world around them, people failed to acknowledge and honor God properly. In doing so, they committed the utmost impiety, according to Calvin, and by their wickedness and profanation of God's majesty, they fell into a state of universal guilt. Calvin describes the litany of sins that humans commit as clear signs of their estrangement from God. These sins are visible demonstrations of divine wrath reserved for the ungodly. He continues by addressing certain groups, specifically Jews and Gentiles, who might believe themselves to be beyond reproach due to an outward appearance of holiness or a lack of knowledge of God's law. He emphasizes that no superficial piety can deceive God, who sees all hidden evils, and he contends that excuses made by the Gentiles based on ignorance are invalidated by their own consciences acting as an internal law, rendering them guilty. His argumentation proceeds to confront the Jews, who prided themselves on having the written law, by illustrating their failure to abide by it. Besides, Calvin challenges the Jewish belief in their exceptional status through God's covenant, stating that any privilege they might have is a result of God's mercy, rather than their adherence to the covenant from which they had already fallen by unfaithfulness. By accentuating that both Jews and Gentiles are equally sinful, Calvin seeks to dismantle any notion of moral superiority. He uses Scripture to prove this point and also addresses the role of the law in exposing sin rather than achieving justification. Calvin stresses that all human claims to righteousness and virtue are null in the face of God's severe judgment. He then pivots to the heart of his message. Justification is attained not by works but by faith alone. He elaborates on the nature of faith and how it connects believers to the righteousness of Christ. Ending his commentary, Calvin aims to subdue human pride, declaring that grace is a gift of God that should not be boasted about but rather humbly received. He insists that this grace is not restricted to the Jewish nation, but is generously offered to the Gentiles as well, further universalizing the message of the gospel that righteousness is a gift accessible to all through faith in Jesus Christ.
Additionally, Calvin offers a rich theological perspective on key Christian doctrines. In his analysis of chapter 4, Calvin asserts the paramount importance of Abraham's faith as doctrinally illustrative, defining him as a quintessential model for believers. By demonstrating that Abraham was justified through faith prior to receiving the sign of circumcision, Paul highlights the precedence of faith over law for achieving righteousness in the eyes of God. Calvin insists that the blessings of righteousness are not earned by human efforts or observance of the law, but are granted through divine grace. Also, Calvin indicates Paul's argument that the surety of God's promise of salvation is predicated on his unwavering faithfulness rather than the variable performance of the law by individuals. He points to Abraham's faith in God's power and promises as the proper response to divine generosity and the prototype of Christian faith. Calvin continues in chapter 5, elucidating Paul's discourse on the fruits of justification by faith. He draws attention to the peace, grace, and hope believers receive in their new status in Christ. By contrasting the consequences of Adam's sin with those of Christ's obedience, Calvin reveals the profound truth that Christ's redemptive work far exceeds the damage inflicted by the fall. He maintains that through Christ, God's mercy overcomes the massive scope of human sinfulness. In chapter 6, Calvin addresses the transformative aspect of salvation. He cautions against any misconception that grace may serve as an excuse to persist in sin. Calvin interprets baptism as symbolic of our unity with Christ in his death and resurrection, signifying the believer's transition from a life ruled by sin to a new existence characterized by righteousness. Calvin concludes that this transformative union with Christ renders the believer's former subjection to the law obsolete. Through Christ, the law is both fulfilled and transcended, as the New Testament heralds not only pardon for transgressions, but also the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which propels the believer towards a sanctified life. In totality, Calvin's analysis elucidates the thesis that faith in Christ is central to justification, sanctification, and ultimate salvation. Moreover, Calvin probes into the profound relationship between the law, sin, and grace, he begins in chapter 7 by addressing the purpose of the law, stating that it was intended to bestow life. However, due to human corruption, the law paradoxically becomes an instrument of condemnation. Calvin vigorously defends the law's integrity, attributing its lethal effect not to any inherent flaw, but to the pervasive influence of human sin. This sin, amplified by the law, reveals the profound internal struggle believers face a relentless battle between the Spirit's guidance and the flesh's rebellion, encapsulating the Christian's earthly journey as a constant war between divine aspirations and mortal weaknesses. In chapter 8, Calvin shifts to a tone of consolation. He reassures believers that, despite their imperfect obedience, they are not subject to condemnation if they are reborn in the Spirit. This regeneration marks the believer's transition from death to life, ensuring their salvation is secure against life's trials and tribulations. Calvin points out the triviality of earthly sufferings when juxtaposed with the magnificence of eternal salvation, a salvation guaranteed and sealed by the Spirit of God. The believer's path, mirroring Christ's own journey, is marked by suffering but ultimately leads to glorification and victory over all adversities. Addressing the perplexing rejection of Christ by the Jews, Calvin begins the ninth chapter with a heartfelt affirmation of his Jewish heritage and a recognition of their unique covenantal status. Yet he navigates the delicate subject of divine election with the assertion that lineage does not guarantee inclusion in God's covenant. Through the examples of Jacob and Esau, he illustrates the mystery of God's elective grace, independent of human merit or effort. This divine choice, rooted solely in God's mercy and sovereign will, forms the crux of Calvin's theological reflection, a profound acknowledgement of God's unfathomable judgments and the inscrutable nature of His divine will. Last but not least, Calvin investigates the theological complexities and practical implications of the text. He begins by addressing the Jewish confidence in their own righteousness derived from the law, stating that such reliance is misplaced. Calvin debates that the righteousness through faith as presented in Romans is not exclusive to any single group but is available to all, though only realized by those elected by God's grace. He tackles the nuanced relationship between the Jews as Abraham's physical descendants and the Gentiles, 
reiterating that God's covenant promises extend beyond visible lineage to those predestined by divine will. This theme of divine election is central to Calvin's theology. He cautions the Gentile believers against pride, reminding them that their inclusion in God's people is solely due to divine grace, not their own merit. Calvin's commentary also addresses the practical aspects of Christian living. In chapters 12 to 14 of Romans, he speaks to the need for harmony within the Christian community, recognizing the tension between adhering to Jewish customs and embracing the freedom in Christ. He advocates for a balance, promoting love and edification over legalism or disdain, respecting the conscience of others, and repeating the importance of unity in the faith. In chapter 15, Calvin reiterates the shared dependence of both Jews and Gentiles on God's mercy, urging them to mutual respect and unity, grounded in the common hope of salvation. He then shares his personal reflections on his apostolic mission and his longing to visit the Roman believers, hindered by his commitment to the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. In sum, Calvin's examination of Romans presents a profound doctrinal discourse intertwined with practical guidance for the Christian community, underlining divine grace, unity and faith, and the balance between freedom and responsibility. In conclusion, Owen's exploration of the scholarly work on the Epistle to the Romans reveals the Epistle's central role in Christian theology and its interpretation over time. He notes the absence of early standalone commentaries by church fathers, though they addressed Romans within broader scriptural studies. Post-Reformation significant commentaries emerged, reflecting a renewed focus on scriptural foundations of Christian doctrine. Luther's introductions, followed by works from Reformation leaders like Zwingli, Melanchthon, Bullinger, and Bucer, marked this era. Notably, Calvin's commentary in 1539 stood out for its clarity and impact in Reformed theology. In addition, Owen then reviews the 17th-century contributions, including Piraeus's extensive lectures, which robustly defended Protestantism against Catholic criticism, notably Bellarmine's arguments. The work of Francois Turretin at the University of Geneva showed a subtle shift from Calvin's strict teachings, indicating a softening of Reformed doctrine over time. L. Nathan Parr's English commentary from this period reflected strong Protestant ideologies and offered deep insights, despite its antiquated language. Further, Owen appreciates the varied perspectives on Romans. He commends Fry, Haldane, and Chalmers for their distinct contributions, with Calvin's work being particularly noted for its direct and logical style, eschewing detailed linguistic analysis for clear theological exposition. Owen underscores the importance of recent annotations in editions of these works, which aid in understanding and engagement with the text. Besides, Owen discusses the diversity of scriptural interpretations and cautions against the novelty-seeking trend in biblical criticism. He criticizes efforts to align New Testament style with classical literature, emphasizing its rootedness in Jewish tradition. In summary, Owen's examination of the Epistle to the Romans showcases the evolving theological discourse surrounding this pivotal New Testament book, accentuating its profound impact across various Christian traditions and its central role in doctrinal understanding and debate.